So, y'all, as expected, things are not looking too good at all. After reading what we're about to go through in these articles, I really understand why the creators of the original Avatar The Last Airbender series, the cartoon series, left this Netflix production, right? It seems like an absolute mess is about to be served to us. Let's get into what the showrunner said in this recent big interview. Let's get into it. So links to everything, of course, will be in my description box. Here we have the big Netflix Avatar The Last Airbender producer interview. This is a remix, not a cover. Great. Is <laughs> Immediately, is when I saw that title, that's, that's the first thing that popped in my head. I was like, okay. Um, there are few modern properties that feel more sacred than Avatar The Last Airbender. I'm skipping around here, okay? How do you improve upon what many feel is perfection and why do it anyway? The approach, according to showrunner Albert Kim and executive producer slash director VFX supervisor, goddamn, girl, how many times you got? Um, Jabbar Raisani, you change it up. In the below interview, Kim and Raisani explain how they've kept a lot of the foundation of the original but are still putting their own spin on it i'm just like okay so the interviewer said a big question surrounding the show is how much are you guys changing and how much is staying the same um how much freedom do you have blah blah blah, blah. so um albert kim said i've used the term that this is a remix not a cover in that you've got to hit a lot of familiar notes but you can't forget this is supposed to be a new song. And I'm like, okay, just how new is this song about to be, girl? Am I gonna recognize the song, babes? <laughs> Interviewer said, you touched on something that I'm really, really curious about. I think when we talk about Avatar's legacy and all the heavy stuff it touches on, people sometimes forget that it was a Nickelodeon cartoon and therefore goofy a lot. Was that silliness difficult for you guys to juggle in the transition to live action while also dealing with those really heavy subjects? I'm gonna skip around in this answer, of course, but I want to get to what they said here about Game of Thrones. They said for us, it was about striking that right balance of making sure you were true to the DNA of the original. But at the same time, we had to make it a serialized Netflix drama, which meant it couldn't be just for kids. It had to also appeal to the people who are big fans of Game of Thrones. And so it had to feel grounded and mature and adult in that way too. So that's, like I said, the tight rope that we have to walk. And immediately here, I was just like, when I think of Avatar The Last Airbender, Game of Thrones is not popping in my head. I think that people, when they think fantasy show, they think successful fantasy show, they automatically think Game of Thrones. I'm just like, girl, going into this, thinking about Game of Thrones fans at all to me is like, a mess and i'm saying this as a game of thrones stand like super stand i don't think it's smart to go into the creation of avatar the last airbender thinking about anything game of thrones like anything anything so strange okay so let's talk about these characters first let's start with azula girl and i know that's weird but we start with azula okay so the interviewer said i want to talk a little bit about azula who is a character i'm kind of surprised to see as much as we have in trailers and first look images because she's not in a lot of season one of the original. So it seems safe to say she has a larger role uh, earlier in the live action show. Why did you make that decision? So the answer was, yeah, so Azula is one who in the animated series, you don't really see until season two. Fire Lord Ozai is also one who does not appear very much in season one, but we made the conscious decision to bring some of those Fire Nation storylines more to the fore in the first season because I felt like we needed to balance out the storylines. Uh, we needed to know more about the background for Zuko and why he's doing what he's doing and said that in the context of his family dynamic and how he fits in with his father and sister. And then he says, and then uh, Albert Kim says, and that's something that they get to later in the series of the animated series, but we had a little bit of a benefit of hindsight. We knew where that was going so we could pull some of those elements up front into the first season and make the first season a little bit richer and a little bit deeper in terms of character storylines. So I think in the animated series, a lot of that was figured out as they went along and then they got to season two and season three and they were able to go more into the backstory and stuff. So what they're saying is, well, so what you're telling me is, hey, we're gonna subvert the logical progression of a story 
the logical progression of a character, we're gonna subvert that, even though in the original story, people figured things out as things naturally progressed, as the story naturally progressed, we're gonna take the elements from later seasons and bring it to season one. We're gonna rush Zuko's character and all that shit so much and give y'all so much unnecessary information about him from season one that we're gonna bring in Azula early. Like that's how far ahead of ourselves we're gonna jump with Zuko. We're gonna jump so far ahead of ourselves with Zuko that we gotta bring in a, a character that didn't even show her face like that till like end of season one, season two. It's not, it's not rubbing me the right way. I think a lot of showrunners are obsessed, especially these like super duper, you know, crank them out industries like crank them out like <laughs> crank these shows out you know i think a lot of showrunners are obsessed with making us sympathetic to every single character we can't have an outright villain because they want to make sure every single character is loved from the start because they also said this we wanted to make sure that Zuko felt like a much more dimensionalized character and that meant bringing in more elements of his family storyline and in my head, that sounds like, it's like, so you wanted to, t you wanted us to feel sympathy for someone who was just supposed to be an outright villain in season one, just a villain. So much so that you're bringing in extra shit, rushing the character and bringing in a whole new character. Like I said, Azula, that shouldn't have even been introduced yet. Y'all rushing this shit so much and we ain't even left the gate yet. He continues, he says, so that naturally meant feeling like we should see a little more Azula and a little more Ozai. If anything, Azula's uh, story in the first season is a little bit of a prequel to her story in the second and third seasons, but that's another element that we thought we should see rather than just talk about. And in my head, I'm just like, y'all are trying to do a lot of premature rushing and showing shit that shouldn't be shown in the, in the first season. So it's gonna rush the characters and ruin their arcs. We're moving on to Katara. So the interviewer asked them, and going back to those narrative liberties, was there anything in particular where you were like, no, this is set in stone, this can't change. Um, Kim said, there's a lot of things like that, starting with the characters. I mean, the characters, we had to dimensionalize them. And I'm just like, girl, what do y'all mean by that? We're just meeting the first, we're just meeting the characters in book one, season one. Of course, there are things that we don't know about the characters in season one that we're gonna find out in season two and three. And I feel like just cause y'all know what's gonna happen with their stories, y'all trying to transfer all that shit from later episodes or later seasons, I should say, into season one, it's gonna be a fucking mess. Anyway, dimensionalize them but there are certain core, um, I would say there's a core DNA to the characters that you don't wanna mess with. I'm gonna skip to what they said about Katara. There are certain roles I think that Katara did in the cartoon that we didn't necessarily also do here. I mean, I don't want to really get into a lot of that, but some gender issues that didn't quite translate, they're talking about Katara. And I just feel like y'all are preparing me for a complete water down of Katara's character. In the beginning of the cartoon show, the only reason Aang even broke out or they got Aang out of the iceberg was because Katara was reacting to Sokka's misogyny. Katara was screaming at Sokka, um, you know, while they were, whatever, on that iceberg, floating that iceberg, whatever. Um, she was like, I'm washing everybody clothes, taking care of, taking care of the community and shit and you're acting like I'm not doing anything like you know what I mean while she was screaming at Sokka for his misogyny girl um her water bending cracked open the iceberg and you know and came and that's it so it's just like a lot of Katara's character was about overcoming issues that she had to face because she was a girl remember that fight with the water bending master who wouldn't teach her because of her gender um, and I'm just like, what do you mean it doesn't translate to screen? I feel like those kinds of things are so easy to translate to the screen. It really makes me wonder what the hell y'all are talking about. And then let's move on to Sokka. Um, so then the interviewer, I guess, said, my friend just watched it for the first time. And she's like, Sokka's an asshole. Um, I was like, yeah, no, he kind of is. And then the showrunner's like, well, yeah, especially in the first season. Then Kim says, yeah. So we had to we had to guard against that kind of stuff. And I'm just like, wait, some characters start out unlikable and it's okay, babes. It's okay. That's how some stories are made. He then continues by saying, and so those are things that aren't really changing as a character. 
as so much as updating them a little bit. And that's not filling me with joy at all. Hearing that is not filling me with joy, especially after seeing a tiny bit of Sokka's performance in the trailer. It's just like, girl, he's going to be a nothing ass character, girl. Um, switching articles real quick, still talking about Sokka, talking about how the live action series will differ from the original. In an interview with Entertainment Weekly, Sokka actor Ian and Katara actress Gia Wendio talked about how the character's initial attitudes toward women, for example, expecting his sister Katara to handle the domestic chores, might not play as well outside of animation. They said, I feel like we also took out the element of how sexist Sokka was. I feel like there were a lot of moments in the original show that were iffy. Um, Ian said, yeah, totally. There are things that were redirected just because it might play a little differently in live action. They said instead of that, they're going to focus on the trauma of his parents and shit. Um, so my thing is, EW said the genocide of the Air Nomads will be shown for the first time in the live action series, but you don't think, so, so you think the audience can handle seeing a genocide happen, but you don't think they can handle a character being sexist in the beginning of their arc. Um, like I said, I think this ties back into like people wanting these ca characters to be lovable from the start. Um, and I'm just like, y'all are ruining these people's arcs. Like, do people really think that we cannot handle seeing sexism, this ism, that ism, whatever ism in, in, in media and TV and shit? It's, it's all about how you handle the characters. It's all, it's all about, is the narrative rewarding them for this behavior or is it not? Are they growing through this? Is their arc, are they progressing through this shit? Like, that's what it's about, girl. Not just the existence of these, you know, themes. It's how you handle it that that people have an issue with. I'm just like, y'all, how, how are y'all missing the mark this bad? And we ain't even start the show yet. We even start the show yet. So now they're talking about Aang's motivation. The interviewer says, I think one of the biggest question is, despite all the remixing, is the point A and the point B still the same as the original? And they said pretty much it's the same. I mean, the state and the stakes of the world, blah, 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 blah. They said they decided to make Aang's narrative drive a little bit clearer. And I'm just like, girl, I don't know how it could be any more clear. Girl, he needs to learn bending, bitch. Like, I don't... <laughs> like, how could it be clear? So they said in the first season of the animated series, He's kind of going from place to place looking for adventures. He even says, first, we've got to go and ride the elephant koi. It's a little looser as befits a cartoon. We needed to make sure that he had that drive from the start. And so that's a change that we made. We essentially give him this vision. I'm just like, girl, he's seeing into the future. He got a crystal ball now. We essentially give him this vision of what's going to happen. And he says, I have to get to the Northern Water Tribe to stop this from happening. This gives him much more narrative compulsion going forward as opposed to let's make a detour and go ride the elephant koi, that type of thing. So that's something, again, that's part of the process of going from a Nickelodeon cartoon to a Netflix serialized drama. And in my head, Aang already had a motivation, a strong motivation, because he needed to go to the Northern Water Tribe or whatever for a teacher to teach him waterbending. And I'm just like, he's kid. He's, he's a damn kid. He's a damn kid. I feel like y'all rushing these characters. Um, like Y'all making it prophetic. <laughs> Now, I, I I mean, also, let that boy ride the elephant koi. Like, he a little boy. Let him do some some fun stuff. Like, y'all are taking shit from later seasons, trying to stuff it into season one, and then cutting out the things that made the show fun, made the characters fun. I'm very, very, very scared, girl. I, I am very scared. And so when I see all these things happening, when I see the, the issues with the characters... I can imagine the original creators of the the creators of the original show sitting there trying to argue with these Netflix people about their characters, and they telling them no, this is how we gonna handle it. Um, because I'm just like, what what are y'all talking about? What are y'all talking about? It's right there. It's right there. Y'all don't have to do much. So I I can't imagine being the creators of the original Avatar sh uh, cartoon show and sitting up here going back and forth with these weird bitches about my characters. Like I would leave too, girl. I would get the fuck up and leave too. It's gonna, it's it's sounding like it's gonna be the Riverdaleification, <laughs> the CWification of this this shit. And I'm just like, girl, it's I, I'm not excited. I'm not excited. Narratively, I'm not excited. 
and it's like i don't even think y'all about to like really knock it out of the park when it comes to the action sequences too girl so hopefully y'all prove me wrong i really don't think that y'all will in the meantime i'm just gonna be i don't know i'm gonna be waiting for avatar studios to really give us that that shit you know what i mean they got the the young adult team avatar coming up uh, with Aang. They got like a new avatar coming. It's gonna be all animated, but I'm just like, I don't know. I'm I'm definitely more excited for what the original um, creators the, like envision for their future projects than whatever the hell Netflix about to serve us, girl. I think they about to fuck it up. Let me know what y'all think in the comments. Thank you so much for watching and I will check y'all out later. Peace. All right, y'all, make sure that you're going to www.zeraxia.com. When you join the wait list there on the site, you will be the first to be notified when I drop my sequel. Also, you'll immediately get chapter one of my upcoming sequel of the upcoming book. Uh, sent to your email as a pdf so check that out also this is a different excerpt uh from my upcoming book so you definitely want to pause to read if you're trying to get your life uh keep in mind that this upcoming book the sequel is following up the first book that is already released called zoraxia wrath of the god king um, I released it a couple years ago, a few years ago. It was my, really, it was my introduction to writing, uh, fantasy and stuff. So just go easy on me. But either way, as you can see here, it's giving 4.9 stars. It's giving 4.9 stars. So yeah, check out Zaraxia Wrath of the God King while you wait for Zaraxia, the vengeance of cold wind, right? And go to Zaraxia.com, sign up, join the wait list, get your free chapter. Thank you so much.